On the breakfast today, we are focusing on diaspora voting and the electronic transmission of results. Why is the National Assembly seemingly opposed to the two? And what do Nigerians in diaspora think? House of Representatives asked Navy to suspend its recruitment exercise because it lacks federal character. More on that this morning. And the University of Lagos uh, asked uh, students to leave campus due to an increase in COVID-19 cases. Studies will now be online. Good morning and welcome to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa on a very beautiful Thursday morning. We're hoping that the weather remains clear all through today so everyone can go about their activities. But before that, there's a lot that we have to talk about. I am Osao Gye Ogbonwa. And I am Anata Felix asking you to have a very good, good morning today. Very chilly. I love the weather. Yeah, it is. It's, it's actually been like this for a couple of days now. Um, I'm always, um, I've, I've said it, you know, a few times that the weather is a little cool. Uh, but the floods, though, the yeah. floods have been it, terrible but, but on the it, island. Even when it doesn't rain, you know, it's still, it's still a little chilly. And last night it was a little cold. Uh, same thing with this morning. Loving it. Completely loving it. Okay. Some things that some people might not be loving is, you know, students of University of Lagos, Unilag. There's an announcement um, by the school management, and that is that the campus will be shut down and all students would have to vacate the school premises by 12 noon today, Thursday. And they say that Thursday, July 15, because of a fear of the spread of COVID-19 pandemic, right? So yeah. the school management confirmed, and this is um, me reading a quote from the school management, Mrs. Oguama. She says, lately, some students have tested positive to coronavirus, and these students have been, you know, sent to the appropriate designated facilities in Lagos, and contact tracing has enabled us to identify those who have had exposure and directed them to isolate. She says the situation is indeed worrisome, especially noting the reluctance of the majority of students to comply with the COVID-19 prevention protocols. And uh, to avoid the escalation of cases, the Senate at an emergency meeting, which is held on Wednesday, July 14th, approved that all students should vacate the halls of residence by 12 p.m. today. Well, Osarige, I don't know how you see this, but I think that this is a quick and smart move. You know, um, Unilag only resumed fiscal classes at the end of May. So it's less than two months now that students, you know, were able to come back to class, you know, attend lectures and see, attend lectures in person, you know, reunite with their classmates and classmates that they haven't seen in a long time, you know, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But less than two months after that, you know, there's news that about um, a few students, no, no specific number now, a few students, you know, were, um, you know, tested positive for COVID-19. So I think it's great that they're trying to nip this in the bud, say, we're not going to be in denial that we can, you know, control this, we, you know, we can have this under control. Let's make sure our students get to safety. And they're asking them to vacate the halls of residence so that online classes can resume again. Well, um... Um, well, I guess the school is, uh, you know, taking these steps in, in the best interest of the university and, of course, of the students uh, itself. Um, we are not clear on how many students, um, you know, tested positive. We're also not clear if they carry out regular testing on campus, and that's how they discovered it, or it was uh, through symptoms that were uh, noticed from a couple of students. And those are some of the things that I believe are important to know um, so that we understand, you know, what next must be done. Uh, because I've seen people, you know, share concerns and say that if you're asking these thousands of students to go home, it means that those who might be positive um, and have not been uh, tested positive yet um, are going to spread it to the rest of the community and rest of, you know, um, of Lagos that's when they That's why they home. began contact tracing um, to see who exactly yeah, you know, but, have they been in contact well, with that's what, and, that's why and what that, they can do next. Well, that's, well, you first of all need to know who's positive before you ask who they've been con in contact with. And so that's why I was asking, you know, if these cases that you're talking about now are cases that they found out because of symptoms that were showing or they have been testing on campus which i'm not sure about we've for a very very long time spoken about the 
inadequacies with regards to uh, testing for COVID-19 in Nigeria. Um, we can see that out of 200 million people, we're still less than, you know, 300,000 that have been um, actually tested. Okay, we've done more than a million um, testing. Um, um, I was talking about positive cases. Um, and so that's, that's where, you know, we have been inadequate. Um, if we had done better testing, we probably would have a better understanding of where we are um, with regards to COVID-19 um, and what steps need to be taken. We are still very, very far below with regards to vaccination. Um, there's still so much more vaccines that need to come into the country, and we're expecting more. I think about three point something million uh, meant to be coming in uh, pretty soon. So there is that. And um, also, um, how can the University of uh, Lagos carry out complete online classes? Do they have the facilities for it? Do the students have the facilities for it? Have we, over time, been able to learn the lessons that were needed to be learned from 2020 and been able to invest more with you know, the, the facilities necessary for online classes um, in its entirety? Because um, if we're being honest, not everybody needs to attend classes every day. Not, uh, not every lecture hall needs to be Classes that have even become day. staggered, you know, even in primary schools. Yeah. They don't attend every day. So. so, But when you make statements about online classes, you know... No, for Unilag in particular, go I know that for Unilag, I don't know about other schools, but I'm going to give them some kudos because friends of mine who are, you know, studying in Unilag, especially the postgraduate program, talked about how it was basically online. So it's great to see that University of Lagos, you know, and living up to their name about being the nation's pride, you know, trying to inculcate online lessons. You have your classes there, you take your tests there. So I think, you know, like, have done some good work in that regard. I think other schools need to emulate that, but then there's also room to grow for that infrastructure to be expanded so that, you know, everybody can come on board and benefit from classes even during the pandemic. That's how it goes. Let's just really just see how it goes. You know, I've always been speaking about lessons that we must learn and ways that we must change and develop and be better um, after what 2020 showed us. And so um, if you like is able to pull this off with full online classes and is able to arrest the uh, COVID-19 situation, then it, it should be commended. Um, and other universities should be able to do the same. You know, we'll be able to achieve full online classes so that we stop seeing lecture halls filled with 2,000 students when they're really originally meant for 500 students or 700. That was terrible um, in my days. Yeah. Oh. All right. Let's move on now to our next topic. We have a video to share with you. It's of Pastor Paul Adifarasi. He's a very popular pastor um, in Lagos, Nigeria. He's been sharing his mind, as he usually does, about the state of the nation. Let's see what he's saying this time. Um... I've mentioned the economy, I've mentioned culture. You've got to go into politics and government deliberately. By the way, if we don't fix some of Nigeria's problems today, that is this INEC problem. I will say it plainly, INEC, put me in trouble if you like, it is a fraud. The numbers in Nigeria, as far as census are concerned, and as far as election is concerned, are a lie. And if nobody will speak up about it, the righteous should speak. And our righteousness is not of ourselves. It is of him, and he will protect. Hallelujah. It is important. It is skewed now so that where the numbers are, are not properly reflected in our voting. This is the only country in West Africa where you move from the ocean to the desert and the numbers decrease, or rather, they increase. The only country, it's the only country in the world where you move from a large body of water to little or no water and the numbers increase. It was not Nigerians that started it. It was the parents of Nigeria who were not good parents. They were not good parents. The, the man, Lord Lugard, was a, a devil incarnate. And what he did to this country, we are suffering it many years later and it's time that we must tell the truth. It's time we must tell the truth. It's absolute, we must. And those of you who benefit from the system, when the judgment comes, unless you extricate yourself in the righteousness of God, that's your own problem. You understand? And if you're in the system, you should behave like Robin Hood. Take from the... Um, that really was intense, Pastor Paul Adifarasi there, basically bearing his mind on the state of the nation to his flock, as they called his congregation, basically saying that, you know, there's been talks about the elections in 2023. You know, INEC has been sensitizing Nigerians. You know, we've had INEC reps come here on the breakfast to talk about the necessity for Nigerians to actually register, get their PVCs and vote. And there's been controversy, um, especially with the House of Reps, the Senate, regarding how elections should be conduct conducted in 2023. Should they be conducted online? Should people vote online? Should the results be transmitted online? 
And all these questions are very important because they really determine what the outcome of the elections would be. What should be the character of the people who are conducting the elections? Loretta Onoche was a very big topic, but good one to know that she's been stepped down. You know, the Senate didn't, didn't you know, go through with, with that you know, screening, that confirmation after the screening. You know, so these conversations will continue to hold even after the elections in 2023. But the issue here now is Adifarasi has been you know, bringing some issues to the front burner asking questions about the integrity of the figures that we're getting from Nigerian government and the electoral body, INEC, as we know it. Basically saying that we cannot trust the figures, basically saying that INEC is a lie, Nigeria's electoral practice and system is a lie, that how would you know, these numbers increase exponentially? When he, basically what he's saying is just sort of reaffirms pictures that we've seen online about kids holding voters' cards. Where it shouldn't be in any part of the world. I mean, when you're less than 18, you don't have that franchise. You don't have that right to vote. I mean, what exactly do you know that would say this has informed your decision to vote as a child, as an underage, as a teenager. So these things are what he's trying to bring to the front burner. Many people definitely would disagree with him. You know, he also talked about being Robin Hood, you know, asking Nigerians not to exploit the system and that those who are benefiting from the system as Christians should take that and give to the poor. So there are also points of controversy within his speech. But how do you see it, Osarage? Um So I think a lot of people actually do agree with him. Um, I saw... Uh, where this uh, was uh, shared and uh, I also looked at the uh, response to it. Um, a lot of people agree with him. I think that the, the major uh, part of this conversation, aside INEC, you know, INEC is uh, the bottom of the conversation where um, it has to, of course, uh, fall in line with where the initial fraud, according to uh, Pastor Adif Farasin, um, where the initial fraud starts from, and that is with Nigeria's census figures. Um, so from 1960, when the British um, initially, of course, uh, had stated what Nigeria's figures looked like, you know, it, it, it is claimed that they, um, you know, created false figures for northern Nigeria to, you know, give them more power, give them more states, give them more representation in the National Assembly and all of that. Um, in 1962 or 1963, sorry, there was another census that showed, you know, that, you know, it, it, those figures seemed to be false. And then, of course, there was chaos. Those figures were cancelled. Um, the North, of course, got back more figures, you know, after they, you know, uh, rewrote the, the figures for the census. 1973 census, pretty much the same thing, all the way till 2006, which was the last time that we had a, a, a national census. Um, and so what he's trying to point out is that um, before we even get to the part where INEC has to, of course, you know, almost seemingly agree with what the expectations are from mm -hmm. uh, the census, the um, census figures initially are fraudulent. Um, and he's saying that there's no way that northern Nigeria has more figures than southern Nigeria. There's no way that you move from a place where there is a desert, there's mostly sand, and you move to where, um, you know, there are water bodies and you expect that the figures will reduce where there's more water, which is, you know, not even logical, you know, in any other part of the world except here in Nigeria. Um, and I also saw people respond and say that they've traveled far and wide, you know, across northern Nigeria. And it really doesn't make any sense that you see states that, you know, are talking about 20 million, 11 million, 8 million. And you go to those places and you don't really get to see some of all these places. Someone spoke about a community yesterday that claimed to have 150,000 people. But he says he's, he's lived there for a couple of years and he doesn't think that there's more than 10,000 people in that community. Um, there's also the, the perspectives people have pointed out where... Um, they, you know, try to convince, you know, the rest of Nigeria that the North actually has a lot of, uh, of uh, numbers because, well, they give birth a lot, you know, they marry many wives and some of all of that. But it doesn't seem to be true. And that's the reason why, like you mentioned, there is underage voting and you see children queuing up to vote because they don't have those numbers. And that's what Pastor um, Adifarasi is trying to point out. So we first of all need to have a proper census that yes. tells us exactly what the figures are in every part of the country. Um, a proper census that everybody sees is, is clear and is, is, um, is um, without issues. Um, and then we can now know exactly what figures to expect in different parts of the country. Before you start talking about ANEC registration and you start talking about voting, let's know what to expect. A couple of days ago, we spoke with um, uh, the uh, Ganala Fulani uh, representative yeah, who said that they had... Uh, 17 million um, Exactly, and they had uh, 9 million registered uh, Fulani voters and some, some of all of that. And... Um, 
if you've been following politics across Nigeria and following, you know, generally how the Nigerian system works, you would, you know, almost look at those figures and say, I don't think that's possible. So those are what, you know, those are the things that Pastor Adifara Singh is trying to point out. The Nigerian census, which we've not done anyone since 20, 2006 and is actually meant to be carried out every 10 years, um, he has called it a fraud and says that we need to um, have a proper census. Let's know where our problem is coming from. I, I really think that, you know, we need to understand how big of an issue this is regarding what exactly in the number is in Nigeria, our population. Because for the past few years, we've been hearing um, about 200 million, about 200 million. There is no specific number. And we should know this. Bets and debts have been registered in the country every day. So we should be able to know these figures, right? And also, it, it, it tells off the lack of, you know, data that we have. This is a challenge. You go online, you want to search, okay, what is the amount of this subsect in Nigeria? And you can't even find it on Nigeria's database. You go on Nigeria's database to get figures about our population and they refer you. I mean, this is something I was listening to on the way show on, on, on the breakfast and they refer you to a United Nations website. Why is it that a Nigeria that is a giant of Africa cannot conduct a census to tell us what exactly is the amount of people in the country? We need those figures for, for, for planning purposes. We need those figures for Absolutely. a lot of reasons. But, but it, it's so sad that this is where we are and we need pastors to wake us up to the reality of what we're facing. But it's good that the conversation is beginning to be had. And we hope that it's a continuous conversation. It doesn't end just with that video clip and with Pastor Paul Adifarasi. Uh, because, you know, people would say that the reason it's difficult to carry out a census in Nigeria, the reason we've not done anyone since 2006 is because there's people who wouldn't want the true figures to be exposed, you know, so that, you know, these numbers of northern uh, representatives in the National Assembly, the number of northern states, the number of local government areas in, in you know, certain states um, will not, you know, immediately look fraudulent. And, you know, so... Yes, we need to have you know a proper census. Yes, we, I, I think it's one of the things that should be spoken about with the next um, national conference, if there's anything like that. We need to have a proper census. Let's know what figures we truly yes, are. We need um, to know. The, a, a government cannot plan if it doesn't know how many people it's it planning can't. for. I mean, look at the COVID nineteen pandemic. It, the fact that we have no accurate data that the Nigerian government does not know exactly where everybody lives. You know, as is, as in, in other countries, oh. it just it just does a lot. It messes up a lot of logistics arrangements. You know, you can't. Ex it's 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 a terrible situation, and we just hope that, like you know, like I mentioned, that the way this conversation has started, you know, civil society organisations, the NGOs, the media can take it up from here, and this is something that we need to begin to consider um, nationally. All right. Um, that's our quick uh, top trending stories. So we'll take a short break. When we come back, let's see what the papers are saying this morning. We'll be joined by our guest, Ezekiel Nyai Talk, after the short break. <laughs>